Today's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 15. The one who supplies seed for planting and bread for eating will supply and multiply your seed and will increase your crop, which is righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but it is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. They will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession of Christ's gospel. They will do this because the service provides evidence of your obedience and because of your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. They will also pray for you and they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace that God has given to you. Thank God for his gift that words can't describe. Amen. I got in last night from Florida. I was on vacation this last week, and a very momentous and important thing happened in my life as I was uh, leaving Florida. And in my life, I have been able to be in and you notice able to be in. It's like a privilege or something. I've been in a ice storm. I've been in a blizzard. I've been in a tornado. I've been in a sandstorm when I was in Jordan. And as of this week, I was in a hurricane. So I'm checking off all of my natural disasters as I go. It's very exciting for me. I'm trying to figure out what other natural... Oh, earthquake. I've been in an earthquake. I'm from California, so that goes without saying. So if you can think of another natural disaster that I need to be a part of, please let me know. I'm, you know, I'm a member of Generation X, so I like chaos and anarchy. So I'll go wherever the disaster is. So just let me know how to get there, and I will make sure I'm present and ready to attend, all right? So today we're continuing a series of messages called The Abundance Dilemma. And actually, we're finishing this series today and exploring how it is we as followers of Jesus Christ understand the reality of abundance and how we live with that abundance and what God might be calling us to be and to do in this season of our lives. Now, we have a lot of different sayings in our culture about money. Here's a few of them up on the screen for you. Like, we're making a killing. That means we're making a lot of money. Or there's a cash cow. And people who uh, maybe come from a culture where cows are sacred, that's very difficult to understand what we mean by that. It means that you've got a lot of cash coming. Uh, cut your losses. Um, money does not grow on trees. My dad used to say that all the time. And a penny saved is a penny earned. And for the bonus, who said that last one? Benjamin Franklin said that last one. All right, good. It seems like when we think about all these idioms around money and different sayings that we have, at least within American culture about money, they're often framed around scarcity, fear, and lack of agency. And very rarely do we think about money as an asset that cannot be exhausted. It's always thought of as a finite thing that can be exhausted and can be completely lost. And so today we want to talk a little bit more about how we live in the midst of this idea of what money is really all about and how it functions in our life. Now, I would have to say for those of you who own any kind of cryptocurrency today, I'm really sorry for you. Cryptocurrency collapsed this last week, as you probably heard. Well, at least one current denomination of it. Those of you who own stock and Facebook, sorry to you as well. It's been a rough week. We live in this kind of economic moment that has a tremendous amount of uncertainty into it. And even this last week when I was in Florida, I went along with my wife who was in a tax conference. So she heard from a lot of the leaders of the banking industry from around the country as part of her CPA work. And they conveyed to her just such an interesting... um, interesting picture of how the economic signals in which we live are so mixed and so confusing 
that we haven't seen anything like this before in, in almost all of our lifetimes and how we're going to address and deal with this. So there's a, a space in the midst of all that anarchy and chaos that's going on in the economic world for us maybe to do and to be something that's a bit unique. So we turn to Paul's teaching in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, Paul's word to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9 that we read from a moment ago is framed in the larger context of chapter 9 on the work of Paul as he was writing to the Corinthians in Macedonia. So I don't want to get a map out to go through this, but Corinth is in the southern part of Greece and Macedonia is in the north. And so Paul writes ahead to the Corinthians to tell them that he's coming to visit them soon. And the reason for Paul's journey is he's traveling around all of these churches in Turkey and in Greece, and he's taking a collection, a financial collection, that he's going to bring from those churches to the church in Jerusalem, the Judean Christians who are under siege, in large part have become an underground church in Jerusalem, and are in desperate need of financial resources to sustain themselves. So Paul's taking an offering, basically. And when he's in Macedonia, he tells the Corinthians, hey, Corinthians, I've been here in Macedonia, and I've been taking up this collection for our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and I've been telling the Macedonians how generous you've always been and how you always give in an abundant sort of way whenever there's a challenge and a call. And when the Macedonians heard that, they said, well, if the Corinthians can do this, certainly we can do it. And so they took up a whole dump truck full of money. And then Paul says to the Corinthians, so when I show up in Corinth, I'm sure you don't want to be the Corinthians that look bad, that you didn't live up to the reputation that I told all the Macedonians, would you? Well, of course not. So it's kind of Paul's sort of coy way of encouraging the Corinthian Christians to prepare their offering because he's coming to receive it. In this text, we hear some of the most familiar teaching about money that we know in the New Testament outside of the teachings of Jesus himself. Here in 2 Corinthians 9, we hear that God loves the cheerful giver. Here in 2 Corinthians 9, we hear the very last verse of the chapter where it says that thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And that's how we're going to end the, the message today with that. But for right now, let's just talk about a few of these truths that can help us understand how money works in our life. So there's five truths that I just want to explore briefly with you this morning with a little bit of storytelling along the way to illumine what this text is telling us about how money can function in our life. And not just money, our time, our energy, any of the assets we have, anything we have, not just cash, and how God can do something great with it. Truth number one, giving is multiplication. Giving is multiplication. Paul says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 and 11, this, an agrarian metaphor about how God multiplies the seed and multiplies the harvest. If you're looking at those verses, you'll see this agrarian or farm metaphor that Paul uses to say that God multiplies stuff, multiplies the seed, multiplies the harvest. You notice how this works? It's the beginning of the process, seed, the end of the process, harvest and that God multiplies all of it. Now, the deep irony in my family is that I'm married to a CPA, but I do the family finances. I'll let you sort that. When I go through the, the finances and I'm sorting all the transactions, I see every month the gift that Bettina and I make to this church. And on the computer program, it pops up in red numbers with a big minus sign in front of it. That's what it looks like on paper. So the way we often understand any kind of giving, whether it's giving an hour to something or giving money to something or any kind of energy, we often perceive it as a minus. After all, money doesn't grow on trees, does it? So that means we, we see things in a mathematical sort of way that if I give this away, then I've lost it. And what Paul's trying to say, that's not the relationship here at all. When I first started working in a church, I was 19 years old. By the way, I don't recommend that. If you're ever hiring someone to work in a church, don't hire a 19-year-old. Bad, bad choice. So when I started working in a church until I got ordained, I was about 24 years old. So there's about five years there um, in my life. And during that time, do you know how much money I gave to the church that employed me? The answer is zero. 
I had applied my infinite logic and knowledge to understand that why would I give money to a church that's already paying me? That doesn't make any sense. Because, you know, when you're 19 or 20 years old, you think you know everything. You've certainly seen the bumper sticker before, quick, hire a teenager while they still know it all. Yes, just like that. And so I thought that it didn't make any sense for me to give money to church, so I gave nothing. I gave absolutely zero to the church I worked for. And then even when I got ordained and Bettina and I got married, we uh, continued the same practice. We gave very little to the church. Even though I was working full-time at a church, we gave very little of our money to our church at all. I was what they call a tipper. A tipper. I had a phone call with a a friend of mine. uh, His name was David. And I was telling him about this keen insight I've had about financial giving to the church, that if you're paid by the church, you shouldn't give the church any money. And David took me to task on this. He challenged me. He said, Craig, how can you possibly ever preach a sermon on money if you don't give any? That's hypocrisy. Now, I hope all of you have friends like that in your life who will speak that word of truth and a hard word of truth, and it was one I needed to hear. And so Bettina and I have been married 28 years. Yesterday was our wedding anniversary. We, we spent all of 15 minutes together at about 6.30 in the morning before I went to go play around to golf and she went to Universal Studios in Orlando. So that was our big celebration. When I had that conversation with David, I sat down with my wife and said, we have to do this differently. And she said, well, I've known that for a long time. I've just been waiting for you to figure it out. That's how my marriage works. So Bettina and I decided to go from tipping to tithing. We went from being a tipper to people who gave away 10% of what they made. And that was a big number. It wasn't just moving the decimal point over one time. It was actually moving it over two times multiplied by a factor on top of that. And what I can tell you, at least from my life, is that there's never been a moment since, not one moment, when my wife and I have ever, ever said we didn't have enough. Ever. Now, this doesn't mean that if I just give God some money, God gives me a dump truck of money. That's not how this works. But what it is to say is that God gives the seed in a multiplying way and the harvest in a multiplying way. And we're going to explore what that means as we walk through this text a little bit more. But simply what I want you to hear is when we make a decision to invest ourselves in this cycle of gratitude and generosity, that God moves in a powerful, powerful way. So a question I would ask you is this, is where do you still see giving as a subtraction? And how might you change this? Let's look at truth number two. We all have a need to give. Uh, This is in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. Paul says this to the Corinthians, that um, your giving will increase the harvest of your righteousness, in verse 10. It'll increase the harvest of your righteousness. So there's a way in which this works uh, reflectively. So in other words, the giving that we do or the the offering that we make, not only of our money, but of our time, of any asset we have, it also benefits us. It comes around to us that there's a way in which it increases the harvest of our own righteousness. So oftentimes what we do is we focus on the need of others to receive in our giving, right? And so, for example, today we're finishing our big drive socket to homelessness, where we're collecting socks that we're going to be giving to Operation Not Watch that they'll be giving to our friends living on the street in the city of Seattle, right? So why have you brought socks for the past few weeks? Because you were asked to. It's the same with Paul as he traveled around the ancient world. The reason why he was collecting an offering is because he wanted to make sure all of the Greek 
Christians or the Gentile Christians knew that their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem were deep in need. And so he wanted them to know the need so that he could take the offering to give to them when he would travel back to Jerusalem eventually. There's actually nothing wrong with that. But what I do find a little bit odd at times is the sense in which we forget that we have a need to give as well, that there is a blessing that is received by us in giving. And you've heard perhaps the American adage, it is more blessed to give than receive. True. Hoarding, collecting, having, and possessing are all victim to the law of diminishing returns. Because if we're always the end user of everything, there's never an, op- an opportunity to multiply. There's never really an opportunity for us to understand our need to give. There was a, a man in my church in San Diego years ago. His name was Bob Wilson. He just died about um, three, three or four months ago. Bob owned a number of shopping malls throughout California, and he owned a, a, a chain of restaurants as well, uh, all throughout the California coast. So I wouldn't surprise you to hear that Bob was a very, very wealthy man. And when um, we had a fire in California in 2018, and it burned down the city of Paradise. Anyone remember this story of the city of Paradise? It just raised by this forest fire that cut through it. Um, Bob was so moved by that story, he felt like he needed to do something, but he wasn't sure what to do. And then he saw a story about students who were going to middle school and high school and even younger who lost all of their school supplies. They lost their backpacks. They lost everything. They had nothing. The families were dealing with job losses because the place where they worked in paradise had burned down. It was a desperate time and condition. Those families had scattered across other parts of Northern California, like Chico and Redding and other places where they tried to settle. But all of the kids were displaced. And so Bob, when he heard that story, decided he had to, had to do something at that point. He had the need to do something, but he just needed the opportunity to do so. And so what Bob decided to do was to give $1,000 to each and every one of those students. All 1,000 of them. And so Bob went with a thousand checks and he gave each student, he wrote their name out and handed each of them a check for a thousand dollars. He gave away a million dollars that day. A remarkable man. Now, Bob did that throughout his life. Bob's given away millions upon millions of dollars. He's one of the most generous people I know, but he's also one of the most grateful people I know. Bob had a practice of every single week. Bob always wrote two thank you notes every week. It was a life practice for him. He always wrote two thank you notes every week to somebody, somewhere, somehow. I was the recipient of several of them over the time I served as his pastor. There's a link between gratitude and generosity, and Bob Wilson is a figure in my life that helped me understand better how that worked. What I'm suggesting is this, is we all have a need to give. Because often we focus on the need of the recipient to receive, but we actually all have a need to give. So a question we might wonder about is this. How and where do you share out of your need to give? And how are needs being met, both yours and others? Let's turn to the third truth, that generosity moves people to God. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13, that the Christians in Jerusalem will glorify God for your obedience. They will glorify God for your obedience. I find that an interesting way that Paul's framed that because what he's trying to help us understand is that there's a lever that gets pulled when we practice a form of generosity in which those who are the recipients of it will give thanks to God for that gift. You see, that's the gratitude. The gratitude is the thanksgiving to God And thus, that cycle begins to work. Generosity begets gratitude. Generosity begets gratitude. It works in a cycle just like that. And so what we need to understand is that we have an opportunity in our giving, whatever it is, time, money, whatever it is we give, we have an opportunity to leverage a spiritual outcome. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with a physical outcome either. The building you're sitting in right now was built in the 1950s, and it was paid for by people who gave money, time, sweat, energy, and effort so that there would be a building that we occupy right now as we worship together. But in Paul's case, he was hoping for a spiritual outcome, and the spiritual outcome is that the Christians in Jerusalem would give thanks to God. And so oftentimes, as we talked about last week, is that we're drawn into relationships where we are the recipient of something for people, and so we thank them. So we voice appreciation to them. Thank you for doing this for me. Thank you for doing that for me. And what happens in this text in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says, no, it's not a two-dimensional relationship. It's a three-dimensional relationship. That as the Macedonians and the Corinthians give money to the Jerusalem church, the Jerusalem church will give thanks to who, everyone? Give thanks to God. So it's a three-way transaction now. It's a totally different way of interacting. Friends, this is what makes philanthropy different from tithing. Philanthropy involves a two-way movement of time, money, and energy. Tithing or giving is a three-way transaction in which God is involved in that equation, just like between these Greek Christians and the Jerusalem Christians and God. The notion is that the gift from Greece was going to bless the Jerusalem church and they would give thanks to God. And in turn, we'll see in a minute, they gave something back to their Greek brothers and sisters in return. Huh. It seems odd to me sometimes when when we have like uh, people we support financially as a church come, like a, a local mission organization or maybe our missionaries we support overseas doing work, that when they come and visit us, they say things like, thank you for supporting our ministry. And, and I understand the intent. The intent is certainly there. But there's this little teeny part of me that kind of cringes inside. Because what I really want to hear and what I think is really encouraging is for that same person to say, I give thanks to God for you. I give thanks to God that God raised up a group of people that had a vision to support the work of the gospel. That your vision of supporting missionaries wasn't about which missionary you like and you don't like. It's more about saying, God, what do you want us to do? And that's what we're going to do. So we're going to give to that thing. And those people say in turn, we thank God for you. And so we're in this three-way relationship with each other that's dynamic and life-changing and transformational rather than just one-way relationship that we just have with one other person in one plane in one dimension. So a question you might wonder about with truth number three is, where might your sacrificial giving build a bridge where a relationship that's broken? No, that's actually the wrong question. What has your giving, when has your giving had a spiritual effect? Thank you, Nancy, for keeping me honest. And what effect does it have on you? God, such an important question for us to think about. Truth number four, generosity moves people to gratitude. This is what we've been talking about between the Greeks and the, the Jewish Christians. Thanksgiving to God. It's in verses 11 and 12 that, that the Judean Christians will give thanks to God for the work of the Macedonians and the Corinthians giving them money. Sounds good, doesn't it? generosity moves people to gratitude. That's how the cycle works. And we should be careful not to step out of it too much. There's a deep relationship between these two things. Most of Paul's writings, for example, are addressed to communities in conflict. So if you read any of Paul's writings in the New Testament, for example, the entire book of Romans is written to a Roman community that's deeply divided between its Gentile faction and its Jewish faction, and they're in a deep conflict together. The early church was in a deep conflict about what to do with Gentile Christians and how do we deal with these people that are not Jewish coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, instead of having a big class about it, instead of having a conference about it, instead of convening all the leaders to get together and hobnob about it, which they did in the book of Acts, Paul has a different tactic. Paul's way of doing it is to say, what would happen if I went out with all of these Greeks that the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem have never met, and I bring a truckload of money from all of those Greek Christians and give it to the Judean Christians? How would that change the conversation? And then what if the Judean Christians were to give thanks to God? And in addition to that, it tells us in the text that it says that there'll be 
praying a blessing for the Greek Christians because of the gift that they've given. You see, sometimes gratitude and generosity can bridge gaps where relationships or groups of people are broken apart. And so someone has to take the first step of saying, thank you to God for someone else, even when you're in a broken relationship with them. It takes great courage to do something like that, don't you think? And what Paul's suggesting is that one of the pathways to reconciliation between people is by engaging in this kind of activity, developing relationships and helping people know each other. So when I was in San Diego, we have um, the church I was serving in uh, Mission Valley, and then there was another congregation in San Diego that was the only African-American Methodist church in San Diego area, in the United Methodist Church. And so there was a time in which every church has its annual meeting, and the superintendent wasn't able to go to this meeting. So the superintendent called me up and says, hey, I need you to go over to St. Paul's and preside at their meeting. So I show up, middle-aged, white guy, at a meeting of the African-American congregation in San Diego. And I sit down at the table, and I get ready to start, and I'm shuffling papers around. I'm trying to look all important and everything. And the leader of the, the black community in that church says to me, you're the first pastor from First Church San Diego that's ever set foot in our building. We're not many miles away, less than 10 miles away. The church I was serving, First Church, big, large church in San Diego. It's the oldest Protestant church in the city. Been around since 1859. It's one of the largest churches in the United Methodist Church. And no one from that church, the pastor, no one had ever set foot in that historically black United Methodist Church, not even five or six miles away. And so I was totally puzzled by this, and I kept asking them, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure? I couldn't believe that, that what they were telling me was true. And so I um, led the meeting, we finished. I told everyone, I got, I've been really been moved by the fact that no one from our church has ever been engaged with you as a congregation within the black community in San Diego. And I said, I think we should change that. We should, we should do some work together. We should figure out how to partner. We should figure out how to build some relationships. And they, uh, they acknowledged me the way any black church would, with deep suspicion. How many times has that community had something promised to it? How many times has it had something told to it? that was not fulfilled. That promise was broken. They had every reason to think I was going to walk out the door and say, well, there they go again, and they'll never be back. So I went back to my church, and I sat down with a group of people that I knew were thinking about some of these things. I said, what do you think we could do to build a relationship with that African-American community? And they took it and ran with it. They took it and ran with it. Over all the years we've been in relationship with St. Paul's, those two churches have never transacted any money ever. There was never a moment at which the big congregation gave a big lump of money like the great white salvation. They're going to come in and help this, you know, small little African-American church. Never. What happened is they began building relationships, committing to time, sacrificing energy, sacrificing um, effort together to work together and build relationships. Did a lot of fellowship things together. People from the the first church went down to St. Paul's and helped them at their food pantry and all the ministries they were doing in the community and vice versa. And it went back and forth and back and forth and relationships were developed over time. It was a game changer. And so after a, a number of years of having that relationship, if you were to put anyone from the San Diego first community in a room, they would tell you that they were by far the benefactors of that relationship. That they learned and understood what it meant better, not completely, but what it better meant to be black in the city of San Diego. And that changed the whole conversation in those churches. It happens in relationships. It's easy to talk about it in the abstract, but until you're sitting across tables, until you're engaging, until you're interacting, it just won't happen. Our church's vision is to love people. That means everybody. <laughs> and that's how we get connected together. That's how we learn from each other. That's how we grow. Generosity moves people to gratitude. I give thanks 
for Sharon Whitehurst Payne, who's the chief lay leader of that St. Paul's Church. That woman taught me so much, and I'll never forget. She's a gift, a gift. So here's a question. Where might your sacrificial giving build a bridge where a relationship is broken? Truth number five, we are most like God when we give. The chapter ends in 2 Corinthians 9 with this statement, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That word for indescribable in the New Testament, that's the only place that word is used in the entire New Testament. And Paul selects that word on purpose because it's, it's a strange sort of word, grammatically speaking, because it's the word of no word. What he's essentially saying is thanks be to God for his, we can't even describe it with words, gift. Indescribable. It's so infinite, so mysterious, so awe-inspiring, so large that we could never imagine it. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Friends, how does God express love toward us? By giving his own son. Yes? Friends, what I'm hoping we can kind of grasp today, that it's the very nature of God to give, to be self-emptying, to be poured out, to be incarnate, that the love of God is expressed in the giving act. We are never more like God than when we give, when we step into the same kind of act. Let me ask you this question. God has given everything for the benefit of humankind, but is God any less God because of it? No, absolutely not. But yet when we come to the same conversation and the same question, we think if we give like God gave, there'd be less of us. This is not how this works, friends. God has charted the course for us. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. We live in a time of unbridled greed and materialism that has run rampant over our culture and over our world, in which those who have have an increasing amount and those who have not have a decreasing amount, and that the polarity between them is growing and growing and growing. And so what could happen for us is you could come to church and sit in the sanctuary and hear the pastor pontificate about how bad that is. You've just spent six days and 23 hours experiencing how bad that is. Instead, what I would suggest is that we have an opportunity, and the opportunity is to live a life like God lives for us, sacrificing everything that we have, giving all that we can, being the most generous people that anyone has ever met. What would it be like for you this week or the next seven days to go about your life to practice an act of generosity so deep, so powerful, so compelling that the person looks at you and says, what's your deal? Why are you giving like this? Why are you dedicating all of this time? Why are you giving this money? And that's the moment, friends. What do you say when people ask that question? Jesus is why I do that. Jesus is why I do that. Because Jesus gave everything for me, and he gave everything for you. How would that change the conversation? What would happen if the church in the United States were to mobilize to be the most generous people on the face of the planet. What in the heck do you think would happen? What if the church just went from tipping to tithing? What would happen? Wow. It just is mind-blowing to me. We have a great opportunity, friends. We have a great opportunity. Whether you give your money to this church or you give it somewhere else, I don't care. What matters is that God has called every single one of us to give as we've been given to. And however we do it, wherever it is, go do it. Make Jesus look good. Let's pray together. God, we pray that you would Give us the grace and strength and power and love that we need to do this work. You call us out of materialism. You call us out of 
greed. You call us out of this sinful world in which, God, we are living, in which we're constantly tempted even. Lord, you know the struggles we've each had with this, the ways in which we've divorced the thinking about our time and our money from our discipleship. But you, Lord, tell us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So help us, God, this day to put our treasure with you. We pray, God, for that which will happen this week. We pray for the people that will be the recipients of our generosity. And we pray, O oh Lord, that they might give thanks to you for the gift that comes in Jesus. All this, God, we commit to you. We pray for your power, your love, and your grace to be at work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this morning, our order of worship is just a little bit different today. And I want to uh, tell you what's going to happen. In a minute, the band is going to lead us in a song. I'm going to tell you what's going on in the life of the church, call to action, and then we're going to sing another song, and then we're going to start our congregational gathering. Sound good? You're surprisingly quiet. I know you just heard a sermon on money, so everyone's like, oh. All right? Good. So, lead us. Thank you. 